Thank you, everyone, and good morning. My name is Claudia, and today we're going to be talking about Agile, but also diversity, or to better say, how diversity, equity, and inclusion can be a true catalyst for business agility and complex problem solving. But before we go any further, I want to get to know you all better. So let's do a quick exercise, quick show of hands. How many of you work in all four an organization with an agile transformation or a journey to business agility? Show of hands if you do. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Second question, how many of you work in all four an organization where, diversity, equity, where there is a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative? That's great. Third and last question. How many of you work in all four an organization where agility and diversity, equity, and inclusion are all treated as part of the same journey, transformation, initiative? Good. Fewer hands. Great. So of good. That, this makes me think my talk has some legs, so that's great. great. <laughs> so let's start. So this is what we're going to be covering today. First, I'm going to give you an introduction about myself. Then we're going to be looking at a real case study. And then I'm going to give you three reasons why diversity, equity, and inclusion can be a true catalyst for business agility. And last, I'm going to leave you with some tangible recommendations around how companies can link the two together for better problem solving. Before we go any further, a couple of things. I'm going to be taking questions at the end. There's going to be time. Also, throughout these presentations, I am talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, all three elements. But sometimes, for brevity, I'm going to say D and I or D, E and I. And last thing, with agility, I mean true business agility, not just capital A agile. But we're going to be looking at defining all of these terms together later on, so everything will become more clear. So, a bit about me. I am Italian. I've been living in London for 10 long years, still not used to the weather, and still have not dropped my accent. <laughs> also, I'm a gluten-free Italian, so very, very particular. I work at PA Consulting, and I specialize in building agile operating models for clients. And that sounds very jargonish, doesn't it? So what I like to say is I like to help clients solving complex challenges. I love problem solving. And one of the challenges that I'm really passionate about resolving is the gender gap in technology. I'm in fact the Women in Tech lead at PA. There is a massive initiative and I'm super passionate about it. And last but not least, I love running. Who else likes running in the audience? Good, there is a park run tomorrow morning after the boat party, hope to see you there. <laughs> Good, so let's start. So as you probably understood, today we're going to be talking about solving complex problems. All the problems that this world is throwing at us, um, COVID-19 pandemic, digital transformation, climate change, we all know. And it is only simple that companies have turned to agility to ease this complexity. We all know that agility eases complexity by promoting empiricism, collaboration, continuous improvement. And I think we all believe that agile actually helps. The best financial performers are also the most agile companies. But how does Agile actually help companies? So without further ado, I want to look at a real case study. So we have this mystery company. It's a huge multi-billion tech company. They do home appliances, consumer electronics. Uh, and as early as 2015, they were voted one of the world's most agile brand. What does that mean? Well, the company clearly had some agile characteristics, like a very strong customer-centric vision. And also, the company, you can't see that on the slide, but the company is organizing end-to-end -end product divisions, bringing together people, processes, and technology, and aligning them against customer and business value. Again, anyone heard about Agile value streams before? And last but not least, as you see on the slide, everything now in the companies is underpinned by a strong, albeit quite recent, commitment to dismantle any form of hierarchy and empower everyone. Due to, to, due to these agile characteristics, I'm under no surprise that this company is one of the top 20 most valuable tech companies in the world. However, this company, like many others, is now facing an increased threat. 
This company now has to keep up to the even higher scrutiny that customers, employees and society has of them. And is Agile enough to actually help this company keep up with high customer and changing customer expectations? Is Agile enough to help this company through this complexity? Or do we need something else? But let's look at one of the company's latest adverts on TV. Earlier mentioned that I like running, but this would not be me. Why? Because as a woman, I would not be running at night alone, let alone with headphones in. And I believe that all of you that also said that you like running, probably you would struggle with this situation. So the company, which now you know is Samsung, has been criticized for being tone deaf and naive. In fact, according to Run Girl Charity, only 4% of women would feel safe running at night. And this begs the question, how many females were involved in producing the ad? How many female decision makers were actually there? The board of directors at Samsung is 90% male, with only one female as a non-executive director. Other four, other four highly doubt there was any consideration to female feelings, but actually, any consideration to diversity, equity and inclusion during the process of developing the advert. So I think that we can all agree that what Samsung did was a very unfortunate mistake. We're not pointing fingers. Samsung thoroughly apologized and they also pulled the ad. However, I believe that this teaches us that there is an opportunity for us all to be better. We can learn from this. We all need to realize that companies are facing an intense challenge. It is an imperative requirement that they keep up with this high scrutiny, high expectations, the awakening that society has of them. Customer expectations are changing fast and they're ever so more stringent. Everyone talks about the conscious consumer. Customer expectations are complex to predict. And what does complexity really need? What does unpredictability really need? Of course, we can talk a lot around methodologies and so on, but at its core, complexity needs different minds. Ingenuity, the true ingenuity that we need to solve this unpredictability needs different perspectives. So it is only simple that to solve the world's most complex challenges, we need agility, of course, but also diversity, equity and inclusion. And I'm not the only one who said that. We need diversity of thought in the world to tackle the new challenges. And who said that? Tim Berners-Lee and also the inventor of the World Wide Web. But now let's look at some definitions. So I'm going to ask for a brave volunteer in the audience who would like to give a short and snappy definition of agility. We have to add on the beach, so anyone short and snappy? If not, I'll give you mine. <laughs> yeah, go for it. The ability to adapt using data, so make data-driven decisions. Absolutely. I like that. Anyone else? Cool. So I think I totally agree with you, and definitely you will see the word adaptive here. So for the purpose of this presentation, this is how I'm going to be defining agility. And we're going to keep going back to these three key themes. So definitely the ability to be customer focused, customer obsessed, putting the customer at the center of everything that you do. 
then the ability to be adaptive, to use data to change, to be truly built to evolve. And then last, the ability to empower others, to liberate people within your organization, to make sure that everyone is at their best. And I'm a firm believer that these three characteristics definitely help all organizations with complex problem solving. But I believe that they are the best when they're complemented by diversity, equity and inclusion. So I'm not going to tease you again, I'm going to give you what I believe a definition for these three elements could be. So three different things. Diversity is the state of being composed by different people, whether by race, gender, opinion, life parts, thought. Here I'm talking about true cognitive diversity. I'm not talking about a specific marginalized group. I know that was given the example of women, but here I'm talking about diversity of people, making sure that um, there is true cognitive diversity. Then equity. Equity is a commitment. It's a commitment to create an environment where the unique needs of everyone are met. And last, we have inclusion. Inclusion is a result. It's a result of having an environment where everyone is safe and everyone feels that they can belong. These three things a lot of times are um, used interchangeably, but they shouldn't. And that's why I'm going to give you an example of a room. So diversity looks at who's in the room. Equity asks who's not in the room, but they want to get in. So let's help them get in. And then inclusion. Inclusion makes sure that everyone's ideas in the room are being heard. There's, of course, uh, um, some ways in which diversity, equity, inclusion, and agility have been linked together. Of course, one of the key principles of the Agile Manifesto is to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And this links very well, in my opinion, to the idea that diversity and inclusion recognizes everyone's individual backgrounds and then treats them fairly. However, I don't think there's ever been made a direct link, a direct connection. Very few people, in fact, speak about this topic. Very interestingly, a survey run by the Business Agility Institute on over 400 organizations found that over 50% of the respondents said diversity, equity and inclusion was never considered during an agile transformation. Just all of you also told me the same. The two are very rarely considered together. But why is that? So I believe there's three key reasons. The first one is, as I mentioned, there is not this explicit link. And as a result, you have one department running your other transformation or journey, however you want to call it, and then the other department with DNI outcomes and commitments. The two leads barely speak to each other. And I also think there has been a failure from agile frameworks and agile training providers and training frameworks to actually explicitly link um, DNI components into their training. The second point is that there is a flawed assumption that that um, an agile environment equals an inclusive environment. So, for example, there might be some agile practices that are not that much inclusive. Peer planning or big room planning is a great tool. Absolutely do it. However, what happens? You have a giant room with 17 screens, posting notes, people running around, people shouting. That sort of environment might not be fully inclusive for, for example, neurodiverse people. And last but not least, agility is now being considered the key to success, the key to organizational survival, which is great for us agilists because it pays the bill. But then there is diversity, equity and inclusion, which you saw at the middle of the executive agenda. It lingers there. It's, it's still seen as a KPI, something we need to do because, you know, it's good. It's more, more a right to do it. Organizations need to take the leap. I believe that neither DNI or agility should be your end goals. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, and agility will help you achieve business and customer outcomes. And then, of course, you know, DNI is the right thing to do, but organizations should stop seeing just as a KPI and tracking it per se, but they should link it to the pursuit of specific customer and business outcomes. And I'm going to show you how they can do it with a clear example later. So we talked a lot around a link, whether there is and whether there is. Now I'm going to give you the three key reasons why I believe diversity, equity, and inclusion actually helps organizations in the agile transformation journey. As simple as that. If they focus on DNI, then they will become agile or they will achieve organizational agility much more easily. 
And that's because it will uh, help you become customer centric, adaptive and empowering. First reason, customer centricity. Diversity and inclusion helps. Why? Well, first of all, um, Agile is great because we moved away from developing a product, basing it on the manager's assumption of what could and would have been successful. As you said, we use data-driven uh, uh, principles uh, to make sure that we test MVPs and then we incrementally go from there. And Agile has helped massively. Sometimes this could lead to unintended consequences if we're not extra careful. So for example, this uncontrolled focus on, on, on speed, fail fast, learn faster. That essentially means that um, we can launch products which are ignorant of a complex, diverse market base. Then there is a huge issue with data sets not being diverse. And therefore, a data-driven approach might lead to products that only work for the majority. And last, accessibility requirements don't usually make the cut into the MVP, and they just build once you know, we evolve the MVP and we go from there. So of course, use Agile and Agile principle ways of working to build products. That is definitely the way to do it. However, also focus on building diverse teams. How do our diverse team actually help you? Well, first of all, it will enable you to create meaning, meaningful communications with customers. How do companies actually talk to customers? Well, usually they create a survey or a random focus group, which is a good idea. However, I've seen a survey for visually impaired people, and it was written with unbelievably small fonts. <laughs> Reduction in group thinking. Data sets are not diverse. There is a huge challenge to solve, which I don't really know how to solve it, to be honest. However, what I do know is that the first thing that companies can do is to change the people looking at the data if they cannot change the data. That way, at least they will, be, they will bring different perspectives on a given business challenge. And last, understanding of unique perspectives. And I love this. In Nirvana, I, sh I would say that the experiences of your Agile team should match the experiences of your customers. That is very hard to do, of course. So the second best thing to do would be to bring in your real users all the time, not just in random focus groups. And I get that's very hard. One of the best examples I've seen, though, is a company that were developing a fetal heartbeat uh, rate monitor, essentially to make sure that the baby was OK and the baby's heart was OK. And this would have been a tool that pregnant women would have had to wear. And it was crucial to make sure that it was not uncomfortable for them. And there was a bunch of men developing it, and what they did, rightly so, they called up all the women they knew within their company, like midwives, uh, pregnant women, mothers, anyone that wants to get involved, and they involved them end-to-end -end in the product development process. These were women that actually basically started working part-time as part of this development team. And it was brilliant, because the result was a tool that women would actually use. Um, at first, actually, um, the first prototype for it, it was a tool that women would have to attach to their, to their belt. How many pregnant women actually wear a belt? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was good that then they changed their approach. Right, so second reason, adaptive. Diversity helps you become adaptive. Adaptive is the key to business agility, which is brilliant. I'm going to ask another quick question to the audience. What do you think is the most common cause of failure behind a journey to business agility? What is that that makes it fail? Afraid of failure. Afraid of, good, I like that. So, afraid of failure, uh, the, you know, the father is unknown, uh, a lack of leadership commitment, these are all the things that I usually hear. I think all of these are underpinned by a common theme. The first question that I ask my clients when they're like, oh, this is hard, like, well, is your organization actually open to change? Is your organization actually open to what's new? Is there any cultural curiosity within the organization? Is your organization open to what's different? I think you know where I'm going with this. The first thing the organization should do before they even announce their agile ambitions is let's focus on building a diverse workforce. 
Let's focus on making sure that you're surrounded by people that do not look like you, that do not behave like you, that come from different backgrounds, that have different ideas. That is the key. That way you will be more alert, you will be more used to uh, live in a, in a place where you see like, different things all the time. So that's step one. Step two, culture of curiosity. So after you have a diverse and thriving workforce, actually make an effort to, um, to, to foster this culture of curiosity. And how do you do that? Through what-if experiments, putting people in someone else's shoes, job shadowing experiments, making sure that you actually reward experiments through your performance review processes. And the result is that everyone not only is able to see diversity, but they will be so excited by it. They will be so excited by what's coming, by what's different, by what's new. And then after that, you're like, oh, by the way, guys, there is this thing, it's called Agile, let's do, you know, let's, let's work in a different ways. After that, everyone will jump on it. They will be like, oh my God, there is something new, we're so curious, let's go and adapt it. I've seen so many organizations only focusing on the last step, and then they complain that the culture doesn't actually accept it. By doing these three things in order, not in a waterfall way, but you get what I mean, uh, by doing these three things in order, essentially you really make sure that there is, a, there is the right culture for Agile to land and Agile to flourish. And last point, empowering. Empowering is, about, is the cornerstone of agility. Everyone talks about it and it's great. Empowerment comes from trust. And that's tricky. There is a very interesting study by Lisa De Bruyne she was showing a, a uh, she had a participant and she was showing the participant a digital picture and she would morph the digital picture to look more and more like the participant's face or less and less. The result was that the more that the digital picture would look like the participant's face, the more the participant would trust the picture and vice versa. The less the picture would look like them, the less the participant would trust the person in the digital picture. This shows that if we only unilaterally focus on empowering others, then we might end up with the result that everyone who's empowered looks like the boss, behaves like the boss. So there's so much focus on leadership agility training, which is great, and you know, what it means to really empowering and trusting others. But why don't we also focus on unconscious bias? And I mean it at the same time. A lot of times we put executives in a room for five hours, deep down on Agile, deep dive into empowerment. Also focus on get them to learn how to manage, recognize their biases, how to unlearn them, and how to relearn how to create a psychologically safe culture. That way you're going to end up with a room where everyone who's empowered looks different rather than all the leaders minus one are actually um, you know, the same as the boss. So these are uh, so the three reasons why I believe focus on DNI, agility will come, and then um, you will be able to solve the problems and the challenges of the future. However, I want to give you some tangible recommendations. These two things have been apart for so long. So we need to be more intentional at merging them together. And what does that mean? First of all, establish clear customer and business outcomes. And then understand how to use agility and diversity, equity and inclusion to help you get there. And I'll give you an example. So there is a department, they want to improve the lives of members of linguistically diverse communities. To do so, they want to develop better and faster products to provide them with the tools they need. Therefore, of course, they employ Agile. Agile ways of working help to speed up time to value, to increase quality, and so on. At the same time, however, they commit to employ a higher number of individuals from cultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds. This will enable them to better understand end users and their specific needs. So I think we touched on it a few times. Agility or DNI should not be your end goals. They, they are a powerful way in which organizations can better solve the problems of customers and the problems of business. Then of course DNI is a good thing to do because it's morally correct. But the business value is, uh, uh, must be understood. It must be used for companies to actually achieve better goals. Second thing that you do, Optimize the organizational design, and I feel very strong about this. 
So many agile transformation now are about breaking silos, create cross-functional teams or team of teams. And there's so much money being spent in redesigning the whole organization, making sure the back-end developers work with front-end developers, making sure there is someone from legal in each team. But we are missing out here on a huge opportunity. The opportunity to actually make sure that the new teams or team of teams that we are designing are diverse. So much literature on uh, make sure that there's all the cross-functional skills. Let's also make sure that all of our teams are so diverse that they represent the diversity ratio in quarters of society so that they can build better products. There's also another thing with this. Diverse teams sometimes are harder to manage at the beginning. Companies need to make a conscious effort not only to build diverse teams, but then to give the teams the time and the space to flourish. Our time, development time, might slow down at the beginning, and that's okay, because in the long term, ingenuity will thrive. Embed DNI expertise. I have a client right now, and he came up to me saying, all of my products need to be compliant with the latest regulation. What do I do to deliver them fast? Well, you embed someone from Risk and Reg in, to work day to day with your Agile teams, your product will be better, you will remove dependencies, and your Agile teams will learn from them. That's great, easy. Everyone pretty much is doing that. However, I think everyone wants the product to be diverse and inclusive, but we still have not embedded no one from DNI into the Agile teams. HR people don't really work day to day with Agile teams to uh, create diverse or inclusive products. I've seen it actually very rarely. Everyone keeps focusing on let's embed someone from legal, from marketing, from digital, but no one really says let's embed someone from DNI to really make sure that Agile teams know what to develop and how to develop it. Because developers are not DNI experts. Last, design ways of workings that actually work for your inclusive workforce. As I mentioned before, sometimes there might be some practices, like best practices, that might not be fully inclusive. Another good example is a send up, which is a great tool, everyone knows what it is. Um, and there is a format, and the, there is the idea that it should be time boxed. And I think it, it's right for certain reasons. People whose English is not the first language, they struggle to be concise. They will speak for longer to say, not very much sometimes, I do that all the time. And the idea that they need, you need to rush them because you need to be within that time box, you need to follow that format, you need to be concise, might put a lot of pressure on them. So again, it doesn't really matter if we follow the best practice, the most important thing is that everyone feels included and we still achieve the same goal. Another point is Agile is very much on the spot, which is great for a lot of reasons. And the idea of having big room planning is to bring everyone together so that by the end of the one or two days, you have an achievable roadmap. However, a lot of times I advise clients, don't do it in one day, don't do it in two days, do it in four days, four half mornings. That way, people who are reflectors, people that need time to go back and think, they can actually do so in the afternoon and then come back the day after with ingenious ideas. Train your Agile coaches. Do not assume that everyone is a DNI expert. Only because a Scrum Master has sat a lot of courses around how to work with people, they might not know anything about DNI. And DNI is a core concept around how you work with people, how you coach people, how you make sure that your team are high performing. These topics are not covered in Agile training and Agile framework, so probably you will need to come up with your bespoke one, unfortunately. But however, it is super important because otherwise we have coaches that are uh, very good at coaching Agile, they're very good at even coaching psychological safety, but they don't go any further than that. And last, measure your success along the way. There's so many metrics uh, that we can use when launching a product into market. And uh, this idea of like product management is linked very well to Agile. Uh, when you launch a product to market, you want to measure things like customer centricity. So you look at CSAT scores, MPS scores, you do surveys and so on. We do not look at things, what is the percentage of groups that are excluded from our products and vice versa? Which are the groups that are included by our products? Another example can be 
you want to make sure that all of your teams are cross-functional in terms of skills, but also start measuring how many of your teams actually reflect the diversity ratios of society. Another thing can be uh, you want to make sure that all of your leaders exemplify agile behaviors. What about measuring whether your leaders also exemplify diversity and inclusion behaviors? Again, the two things are treated together. And the more that you continue your journey towards organizational agility, the more diversity and inclusion measures should be there and should also track those as well. So who should be responsible for all of this? Well, as I said, as I said earlier, um, to unite diversity and inclusion and agile is the best way to solve the problems of the customers and of businesses. It is therefore a strategic imperative that cast, uh, the agility and DNI are united, and this will lead to a better execution of the business strategy. So a lot of jargonish, but I believe that the person who should be ultimately responsible should be in fact the CEO. He's the owner of the business strategy. However, I think that the, the more that I think about this lack of an explicit link between the two, the more that I believe that there is an opportunity for us all to be intentional. All of us can start doing from tomorrow the simple things on the slide before. And that way, all of us can fully realize the potential of agility and enable complex problem solving through this enhanced focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that that is the key non-negotiable for us all. So thank you very much. That's a, really, um, that's a really interesting question. Um, we uh, actually had the same for a company that I was working for. We were doing a lot of uh, training for women, which was great. Uh, however, all the training was basically addressing women that went to private schools and they had the best life that they could possibly believe. So we uh, actually launched some school outreach activities uh, um, in uh, disadvantaged schools. And we brought the executives down to do it with us. Um, that way, the executives that did not understand the challenges that um, other people might have, they've actually, start, uh, they've actually become more sensitive, uh, sensible to them. And uh, just by seeing them firsthand, now we ensure that all of our training, and these are different training topics, by the way, but all of our training uh, actually also encourages us thinking uh, uh, about different socioeconomic backgrounds as well. But it was because our executive board, as diverse as it was, because in that company used to work for ages ago, it was really diverse. However, they were all from the same socioeconomic background, so they didn't recognize that, so they had to see it firsthand. Yeah. How do you how do you approach this to make sure that like everyone gets a fair shot at like sort of technical interviews or, or not being discriminated because they don't have the opportunity to sit down and do your vocational exercise or whatever? Uh, it's a, I think it's a brilliant question. I think the answer is that with interviews, um, I think companies need to be a bit uh, more selfless. Um, there is no one size fit all. Everyone has different requirements, and if we want to employ different people, we need to cater for different requirements. So for example, they asked me to be an interviewer, and my day job is very busy, so I said, well, I can only do between six till eight. That time works so well with other people. A young professional like me, you know, the six till eight, they're great. They actually like to come into the office, like to do it after work. That's great for them. 
But for working mothers, my availability was definitely not working. So my company decided that we had a very different pool of interviews. Some of them might be able to sit in the room with the candidates so that they would do the technical exercise with them. Some of them might be able to give up their evenings. And we had to be very selfless because we're very committed to recruit different people. Otherwise, if you only offer like nine till 10 slots, it's not gonna work for everyone. Any? So I think, um, so as I said, I do a lot of um, stuff with like women in tech and things like that. And they've just, we just launched actually a big women in leadership initiative, which is brilliant. Um, I think um, that could send the message that women are the issue, that we need to train women, or you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, initiative to bring in people of color. They are not the issue, we are the issue. Like minorities are not the issue. All the activities that we do to include them, we really need to make sure that the message lands that it is the majority that needs to change. The training should be on the majority. We should, we should not be training women to be better leaders, so to be better technical people. Like we should be training the others to accept the fact that women are great or you know, people from different colors and socioeconomic backgrounds are great. That is how we should focus the training. And that's how essentially you bring minorities on the journey. Otherwise, it might feel very daunting. Even when I, I got asked to lead the Women in Tech initiative, I was like, well, of course, it's an honor, but I want a man sponsor. I don't want to be doing this on my own. I have a very busy day job. Doing this on top of my day job is going to be huge. You're asking me, probably because I'm a woman, so I want a man ally in the senior executive team that actually does the doing with me because that will drive change, not just you know, tell women like, to sort out the diversity issues by themselves or to tell minorities to do that. Yeah, that's very, that's, that's very challenging because um, you're not going to come out of that training saying, I realized that my unconscious bias was towards X and now I'm going to solve and this is the metrics. No one's going to say that. Um, you see the outcome metrics essentially. So we had um, with an issue whereby um, people, would, people who could get resources onto projects. Sometimes, you know, senior people that would choose them, they might be a bit unconsciously biased. This was in my previous company. And um, essentially, we just started tracking how diverse are the new teams now? Like, how diverse are the teams being addressed? Um, there might be not a direct link with that specific training activity. I think the link was more towards all of the activities that, uh, like, the company was doing, um, a previous employer. But that is the best way to, 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 to measure it. And also, actually, have a word um, with the employees. Like, have not just them, any, any employees. Like, do you think like there is some bias against you? Do you feel like people are being unconsciously biased against you? And then, if, not, any, if no one says yes, then you're like, okay, at least you know, no one, no one thinks they've been discriminated. And they might still be, but that is also a good measure to look at. Um, I think the, the key thing is like, so, well, first of all, show them the numbers that clearly say that d and I bring business success, but then um, don't focus on things like um, metrics, quotas, people don't respond well to them. Focus on things such as if you employ these type of people or if your team is more diverse because of this, then you will achieve this outcome, this goal. And that's why it's very important. Like, let's in the example that I've given earlier, the government department, let's say the senior exec didn't want people like, who were non-English speaker because he didn't want them, for example. Then you would say, well, actually, you want to sell a product to that community, therefore you need those people into your company to actually input into the product. You might not like them, but you need them. They are your source of success. Um, in the same way, like, um, I mean, there could be so many different examples, even the one around producing, building products for mothers. Uh, if you don't have women in your company, then good luck with that. <laughs> so, I was 
wonderful talk. I love the point about um, questions. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I don't know if it's too simple to say also if you know, you know, but I think um, it's a, so I can only give my experience, for example. Uh, sometimes when I, my old employer, when I used to go into projects, uh, everyone would assume that I was the comms and culture expert. No one would assume that I was the engineer. Uh, and that's what gave me a, a hint. I was like, hmm, maybe. And I think it's things like that. If you feel like you're being treated differently, but there is no clear explanation, if you feel like people are making assumptions, then uh, um, that, could be, that, that could be one of the triggers. And um, also try and, uh, and challenge them, try, try and ask. So when I actually asked the person, I was like, why did you assume that I was a comms and culture expert, but not an engineer? That person reacted very well. He was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. He took me through. I was like, okay, his bias was unconscious. I asked the same question to someone else and he was like, what are you on about? I just think that you're young so that you can't be an engineer. I would, you know, I would say the same to everyone. It's, just, just, it's not just because you're a woman. So I was like, okay, so you're actually now like, directly saying that to me. Um, so you, know, you can tell when the bias is conscious and unconscious by how we, you know, people react when you address the issue. Right on time. That's amazing.